Hello, everyone, and welcome to At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Jeff Jones, CEO of H&R Block. Jeff, nice to see you. Great to see you as well, Andy. Thank you. So I want to ask you all about the company and the transformation mm-hmm. that you're leading there. But let's start off a little bit with taxes and okay. maybe just tell us a little bit about some of the key issues in the tax season just passed yeah. and then coming up into 2024. Not too early to start thinking about that, right? Yeah, well, no, it's for us especially, it's never too soon. I mean, you can talk about that two ways. As a company, we haven't had a normal tax season in many, many years. A lot of regulatory change, obviously the pandemic, natural disasters, those all cause the filing deadlines to move. It crosses fiscal years. So it's been a pretty rocky external environment. To the consumer, to the taxpayer, every year there are thousands of changes to the tax code. Now, as we look at 2024, we actually, for the first time in many years, are not aware of any major changes coming. So from that standpoint, we think and anticipate it'll be a more normal year. But Obviously, we're thinking about it year-round. Interesting. I want to ask you about the IRS. Yes. On the one hand, you have people saying, defund the IRS. On the other hand, you've got more funding coming to the IRS yeah. from the Biden administration. Yeah. Where are things going to play out, and what's your take on that situation? Well, I've learned not try to predict what the government's going to do, so I won't make a future prediction, but we absolutely support the IRS receiving funding they are notoriously underfunded. So you think about we represent the consumer every single day and you don't know where your refund stands, you don't know why it's taking so long, you can't get someone on the phone with a question. I mean, those should be more basic service requirements, but they're, you know, they're overtaxed and they can't do it. So as a company, we definitely support them getting more funding. Pun intended with the overtaxed. (laughs) (laughs) You don't even know my own tax jokes. Right, there you go. (laughs) Um, question mm-hmm. about tax evasion. I mean, there's the mm-hmm. two two things, tax avoidance, which is legal, mm-hmm. tax evasion, which is not. Yeah. A lot of people are reading stories about more and more tax evasion, the Panama Papers and things like that. Right. Is there more tax evasion going on in this country right now, do you think? You know, it's hard to say. And, and, and to be honest, the consumer we serve understands their obligation. They're all getting refunds. And so... It's a different relationship maybe versus you know who our audience is today that's thinking differently about tax strategy. The core H&R Block consumer, they know their duty. They're trying to get the max refund every single year. They're trying to maximize that benefit, but they're definitely not trying to evade what the law requires. Let's switch over and talk about H&R Block. Company was founded in Kansas City in what, the 1950s? 1955, yeah. Tell us about the company where it stands traditionally, and then we can talk a little bit about where you're hoping to take it. Absolutely. So traditionally, it is by far the market leader in consumer tax preparation. It's the biggest, longest standing company that does what we do. It's been traditionally very much a brick and mortar business. You come into an office, we're on every corner in America, you walk in, you meet with your tax expert, and they do your taxes. That's really what we're known for. Uh, We know we're a highly trusted brand. We're a very recognizable brand. But just even that description presents some challenges. And that's the transition to what are we doing about that reputation that's good and bad and the changes we have to make to the business to be more relevant and to be more modern. All right, so let's talk about some of that, those things. I know you're interested in, obviously, digital is a huge part of your future. Small businesses, the underbanked. That's Where right. are you hoping to take the company, Jeff? Well, I think the, the, the broadest way that I think about it is we're going from being a consumer tax business to a financial platform for Main Street America. And that might sound a little buzzy. That's the simplest way we describe it. But that means a few things. It, it means for consumers, we want to serve them in more digital, easy ways. We obviously have an enormous amount of expertise, and so we help people in lots of ways, maximize their outcome. Small businesses is tax, it's bookkeeping, it's payroll, it's helping small businesses form an entity structure that help them maximize their taxes. And then financial products, it's everything from short-term lending to refund advance loans, and then importantly, a product we call Spruce, which is a mobile banking platform for the underbanked. 
Right. So, so what's the business model here specifically, either holistically or with those specific areas? How do you guys make your money then? In simple terms, we make money as fees for expertise. That's the broadest way I can simplify it. And What would be an example then? So a consumer wants our help and they pay us a fee to do that work for them. That could be tax prep, it could be bookkeeping, it could be payroll. That's the predominant business model. The things that are changing about the business model are starting to reduce the seasonality of the business. So we're no longer just a first quarter kind of company. Small businesses help us do that. They need needs year round. And then in the financial products business, it's mainly an interchange business model where we make interchange when a consumer uses one of our products like Spruce and they make a purchase at a retailer. We make interchange from that transaction. That also helps us build more year round business that's not as seasonally concentrated. Right. And some quarters, you guys would actually lose money because of the, the seasonality of the business. Is that correct? And you're hoping to get away from that, right? Absolutely. And to be clear, you know, that will take time. We do several billion dollars in a very concentrated way. People that look at our financial struggle sometimes because they look at our income statement or our balance sheet, and it looks like we carry a lot of debt or it looks like we lose a lot of money. And we do in certain periods. But at the end of the day, on about three and a half billion in sales, we generate almost 900 million in EBITDA and over 700 million in free cash flow. Mm. So we're a very profitable business, but it's hard to see that because of our concentration. Haven't there been some issues in your industry with regard to claims about misleading what's free and what isn't free in terms of tax prep? What, what was that issue? There absolutely have been claims about that. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud about how we handle our free product. And I'll give you a quick example. When a DIY, a do-it-yourself filer uses our software, they start for free. And if there's anything about that interview that happens that changes their price, we have a pop-up window in the product. We call it price preview. And we tell them very clearly, here's why your price is changing and here's what your price is, is changing to. Uh, our competitors don't do that. Mm -hmm. And so we value transparency. We know that the price that someone pays really matters and we do not want it to be a surprise when they're done. Another issue facing the business has been issues of privacy. I yes. think there was a government report recently which suggested that perhaps um, there was some data being transferred to the big tech giants uh, from tax prep companies. What about that situation? Yeah, I, I'm really glad you asked that. That's referred to as pixels. Mm -hmm. Pixels are widely used by advertisers in every industry. And when we learned that we were sharing information with the platforms we advertise, we immediately stopped it. So the kind of thing that was shared was maybe we learned that you qualified for a certain credit and that was shared. What was never shared, and this is really important to be as clear about it as we can, never any personally identifiable information. Never name, never zip code, never address, never phone number, never any tax forms from a 1040 form or a Schedule C. So we did share something like we know you qualify for a tax credit and we immediately stopped that when we were notified. I'm curious as to whether um, h and Block is starting to use, I should say, um, AI. And uh, obviously that must be something you're considering or exploring though, right? We absolutely are. And this is something that's evolved over many years. You know, we started years ago in what's called robotics process automation, probably a simple version of what we now know as generative AI. And then we embedded that in our business. This past year, we used an AI model so if you switch from a competitor to H&R Block in our software, in the background, we automatically reviewed that return. And if we found that any mistakes had been made, we automatically would know you, notify you so you can file for an amendment. I think that's a great example. We called that the intelligent tax assistant. And then we've also recently announced two really important partnerships with OpenAI and Microsoft to go even farther with generative AI. So, there's no question it's a, it's a hot topic and we're leaning into it. Do you think this would impact your employment level? You know, I don't know over time. There's no question we're exploring things to help become more productive. 
So it may be an issue of hiring less in the future, mm -hmm. but I don't see in the near term where it has any impact on the headcount we currently have. I want to go back to the uh, underbanked uh, population in that business model. Is that really a good business for H&R Block to get into? I mean, maybe it's not a very high margin business. Uh, how does it work? I think the, the advantage we have is this population we're talking about is already our tax client. Mm -hmm. And so they trust the brand, they come to us with their most sensitive financial information. And so the product we're offering in Spruce allows us to have a different business model than if it were our only business, like some of the challenger banks are in. That's why we're able to build a successful business on interchange and not have to think about other ways to monetize. It's a product offering, it's not our main business, and that gives us an advantage. Are you guys in all 50 states? I know you have all these brick and mortar <laughs> stores all over the place. Talk to us about that, your footprint. I like to say we're in every congressional district in America. And so not everyone knows we're about one third franchise and two thirds company owned. But there's no question you can see an h and block on your way to work in almost everywhere in America. But not an international business, right? Or is it? We do have the, we do the similar kind of business in Canada and we do a similar kind of business in Australia. We have team members in the technology engineering part of our team in Ireland and in India. So really three countries where we do tax prep. I wanna switch over and ask about you a little bit, Jeff. I know you worked at both Target and Uber before you got the job at H&R Block. What did you do at Target and what was your takeaway there? So my title was Chief Marketing Officer at Target. And at Target, that means a lot of great things. It's a, it's a great company, obviously. And so that meant staying very close to the customer, launching new digital products like Cartwheel and what's become the loyalty app, launching new consumer brands like Pillow Fort and Made to Matter and Threshold, a uh, few that come to mind. So that job was very much a drive growth, stay close to the customer and innovate. Obviously, many of those things translate to a tax business, even though it might not seem like it on the surface. You were also an executive at Uber. I was. What about that? What did you do there? So I was the first president of the global ride sharing business for Uber. I left after about six months. And when I left that job, you know, I said pretty publicly that it was clear to me that the values and approach to leadership at Uber were not consistent with me. And I think, you know, when I left, many of the things that have been well written about Uber were not yet public, but I think uh, the audience probably knows now many of the, the struggles the company was having. Not a good fit, as they say. It was not a good fit. Right, okay, and so you come over to H&R Block, they had just had five CEOs in a decade. What was going on there? You were number six, but it seems like yeah. you stuck because that was six years ago, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it has definitely stuck, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm really proud of what we're doing. <laughs> You know, when you, when you join a company that's had that much turnover, you obviously know many things have been tried mm -hmm. um, and many things had been tried. So a lot of change, but not a lot of progress. And the first place that I looked was at the culture of the company. And I know for a lot of people, culture is harder to put in the spreadsheet and model and understand its financial role. But we absolutely believe that the culture we're creating at the company is enabling us to innovate faster, to grow more, to drive greater employee engagement, and all of those things are leading to our success. And so that's where I really focused, was helping the company see that the individual people could do something they'd never imagined was possible. And that's the path we're on. I wanna ask you about economic signals that you might see in your business. What kind of economic signals do you see, maybe from customer behavior, and what are they telling you right now, Jeff? The, I see two signals. And the first one is how quickly do people seek their refund? How fast do they file when they're able to file? And do they decide to purchase any of the products that help them get their refunds faster? We call that refund advance as one example. And what we see, Andy, is the consumer needs money. Um, the middle income consumer, broadly what we just call middle America, they're not in great economic shape. And those are the two ways that we see that. But I think what always inspires us is they're incredibly resilient. Their mindset doesn't say we're struggling while their bank account might. 
Um, and that's what we do every year is serve that customer to help them get the most they can as fast as possible. But we see that happening earlier, which is the first signal about the maybe the broader economic trends. I have to ask you about filing, paper filing versus e-filing. What, what's going on there? Are people still filing with paper? And how is that declining? What are the trends look like there? Uh, believe it or not, there still are people that um, get a paper form. They fill it out with a pen or pencil, mm -hmm. and then they mail it to the IRS. Do not do that. <laughs> Why I, not? I can't stress enough. Because uh, A, you don't have to. They're, they're, you don't have to worry about the IRS and security. That, that is largely handled. And the IRS is built to process e-files faster than paper. So if you really care about getting your, your return process fast, getting your refund faster, absolutely e-file. Uh, it's safe and it's the best way to do it. And, and final question, mm -hmm. Jeff. You've been CEO, as I said, for about six years. Stock had a good run up to 2022, uh, then it lagged. Now it's bounced back. What's going on yep. with the stock, one? And two, why should investors buy your stock or hold your stock right now? So, you know, I don't get on the scale every day and I don't look at the stock price every day. But if I take a big step back over the last five years, our total shareholder return, our TSR, is 63%. We've raised the dividend by 30%. Our EBITDA is up 15%. EPS is up 66%. And we're still trading at about nine times forward PE. So what I hear from investors the most is, we can't find on our screen a company that generates $700 million in free cash flow that returns all of it back to shareholders and buybacks and dividends. What are we missing? And so we have great conversations and they understand the business better. They understand how undervalued the company is. And that's always a great signal for why they're buying. And so it should be a good thing for them going forward, you think? We think the stock is incredibly undervalued. You know, if I look back six, seven, eight years ago, maybe a little bit longer, uh, we were trading in the mid-teens as a multiple. The stock price was less. And so we are a better company today. We're generating more free cash flow today. I believe the year I started EPS was $2 and change. We've guided to well over $4 this year. So the company's in better shape and we're excited about where we're headed. All right, best of luck to you. Thank Jeff you. Jeff Jones, CEO of H&R Block. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. This is At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>